It's Bourbon Blog Live. It's been a little while since we've done one of these with our good friend, Alan Bishop, the alchemist. Yeah, what's up, man? It's good to what's see you. What's happening, Mr. Alchemist? Spirits of French mm. Lick? Yes, always not much. Always doing something new and interesting. You I wish always. I wish I was cooler than I than I actually am, Tom. I just woke up from a nap, so if I if I if I look under the weather, it's because I was literally just asleep. So hey, I think the I think the bourbon's going to wake us both up here always, and everyone watching, tell us down below what you're sipping on, and uh, maybe tell us down below also what your uh, favorite spirits of French lick whiskey or brandy or product is. This is the new Hindostan Falls straight bourbon whiskey, and uh, Hindostan is, um, well, it's, it pays homage like all of your bourbons and whiskeys do to someplace very unique in Indiana. Here in Hoosier land. That's, That's why right, you say you're it. in Hoosier land. That's why you say it, Hindostan as opposed to Hindostan, because in <laughs> Martin County, they'll get super mad at you if you call it Hindostan. It's Hindostan. Better say it right. You got to say it right. You got to say it with that Hoosier, Hoosier dialect. It's Hindostan. So that's right in Austin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that one's um that that one's pretty damn special to me. I feel like I say that about a lot of our products, but like there's certain ones that are more passion projects than anything else. Right. And that's one of them. So, um, you know, back in my moonshining days in my 20s and my agriculturally centric days in my 20s here on the farm in Pekin, Indiana, uh, I put a lot of work into doing a lot of plant breeding and that corn right. variety that's in Hindostan came out of that work. Um, literally coming up on almost 20 years of working with this corn variety. And it's not just a corn variety that anybody could just go out. You can buy it now. It's out there now for yeah. sure. But yeah. back then, I mean, we created this thing. It came, I created this um, on accident. <laughs> literally. Well, on accident. How did the accident happen? Uh, so what had basically happened was there was a year where I, so I had this low field on the farm. This is all gor dorky agricultural stuff, but this low field that would get wet every year and soupy and swampy and nasty. And so I was playing around with some different corn varieties, mostly sweet corns at the time. I was breeding for like high color sweet corns for like high anthocyanin and various different amino acids. So that that way, when you eat them, you actually were getting them. And it got flooded out. And so I didn't have any more sweet corn seeds. So I threw, I don't know, three or four different varieties of corn in that field that year. And I thought, well, if it does something, it does something. And it was just filled corn. I didn't have any like, there was no grand narrative of like, oh, I'm going to, you know, sell this for decoration or cornmeal or make whiskey out of it. You know, maybe if I got something off of it, I'd feed it to the hogs or whatever. But um, it lived like not all of it lived like wow. maybe an eighth of it lived, but it lived. And then it was all crossed together. And I thought, well, that's, you know, I've been doing that with sweet corn for a long time. Let's, let's play with that project. So um, I had been in contact with a gentleman whose name slips to me now because it's been years since I've talked to him, but he was a retired public domain corn breeder for the University of Kentucky. And he had worked with this variety called Tuxpano out of the Caribbean, which is kind of this real heavy flinty corn uh, for years trying to commercialize it. And he sent me a bunch of seed. And I started making these complex crosses of all these other open pollinated heirloom corns, plus the crosses I had from that first year into this Tuxpano, because Tuxpano was incredibly, A, it, was, it tastes delicious, makes the best right. grits you've ever had in your life. Um, B, it was incredibly drought tolerant, right? And again, at this time, I'm not breeding necessarily for whiskey. I was breeding for the farm and for the animals I was raising, because we raised about 150 heritage turkeys a year. We usually had about 10 or 15 hogs at the time. We had guineas and quail and everything else. So this is all centered around food production at the time. Right. And it was right around the time I started getting back heavily into home distillation. So a couple of years into it, um, I had access, of course, to the German seed bank. I had access to the USDA ARS, ARS Grin system. I had access to seed savers all over the world. Ran a forum with a bunch of seed savers and a bunch of like really dorky plant geeks. I mean, beyond... Beyond anything bourbon dork that you can imagine, these, these people were like, and I'm one of them, but they knew far more than me and uh, started making all these crosses back and forth over the years. And I was selecting, I wasn't selecting for color. I wasn't even selecting for um, some of the more common traits, like whether or not it was a dent corn or a flint corn. Right. What I was selecting for was drought tolerance. I wanted the plants to all be roughly about the same size. I wanted two ears per plants because that per plant because that's one of the the secrets of corn yield is that you always get more yield off two ears per plant even if they're small ears than one large ear 
Um, so those were the things I was looking for and low, low fertility uh, agriculture in particular, right? Not having to do a lot of fertilization. Um, and right around that same time that I planted, I think the first like true full acre of it was that fall was when I, I fired up the big 150 gallon pot still that I had on the farm. Because uh, then what do you do with it, right? I got the corn, but what the hell do I do with it? Nobody buys filled corn at the farmer's market. Nobody gives a shit. So made whiskey out of it and it made great whiskey. And so I just kept working with it. And when I got on at Spirits of French Lake, that was like, that was one of the things I told the, the owners. I said, you know, I got this corn. Been working on it for years. You guys have a farm. I'll provide the foundational seed stock and Jeez. we can grow this corn and we can do something with it. And so that uh, second year of distillation there at Spirits of French Lake, we laid down the first barrels of that. Ironically, I think what you have, I can't remember the year on it. I think right. that was year two is what year that two. was. Yep. Gotcha. Because I had some older stuff. There's a weird thing that happens at Spirits of French Lake in our, our warehouses. So for most products, four years is spot on, beautiful. Um, short of the Solomon Scott Rye whiskey, it, it likes five years. But the products that tend to like four years are terrible at five years. And then they get better at six and seven. So okay. I didn't put out the older stuff, but there's something about that warehouse and the way that the interplay happens in that warehouse at year five. Some of those things just really change. Don't show right. So this is then this is one talent. Then. This is mm -hmm. how old yeah. is this one again? So that one would be 2018, I think. Okay. Would so a little over five. season. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Uh, and and again, it's you know the story of the grain. You obviously with your your slogan, your motto, that is uh, respect the grain. This really, you know, this, the grain is really important on everything you do, but this one really goes into, this is some, some deep stuff. I mean, what, this matters. Obviously you were, you created this. What, what has this done to the flavor of, of what you were looking for? What are you, what are we experiencing on this, this mastery? So ironically, and even before, even before we touch on that note, um, that corn was actually kind of part of my way into the industry on okay. top of some of the stuff we talked about in the past. So cool. uh, I had a good friend that was friends with Steve Beam I, and Steve never did use that corn, but we were working on getting him some of that corn when I got into the industry. Right. But the Licorice Brothers, I sent them a strain of that years ago. Now they have their own strain of Amanda Ooh. Palmer corn. So it's named Amanda Palmer after the lead singer of the Dresden Dolls. Right. I have to come up with weird names for everything that I do for something that inspires me or some local area or something like that. But um, anyway, so there's also a couple of other distillers out there. Also, corn grower uh, Robert McDonald uh, out in Pennsylvania. He grows a lot of grain for a lot of distillers. He has his own strain of that out there. So and that was the goal was make this super genetically diverse so people can still select what they want for their geographical region. Right. Um, so anything out there with Amanda Palmer in it might be different strains from different places, have different traits, taste different. So this particular the strain, foundation of what you've done, but it, they've added something to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, like Iron Root Republic, what they do with it, uh, the last that I knew, and I'd have to check up with them on it, but um, they weren't using it as the main corn in any of their mash bills. But what they were doing is they were treating it like rye or wheat and using it as a flavoring grain in some of their mash bills, which is kind of a cool way of sort of tackling that particular corn. Um, but what you're tasting there is one of the things I selected very heavily for was the sort of trait in between flint and dent corn, where right. you'll have a few dent corn kernels, you'll have some flint corn kernels, but there's what they call flinty dent. And the reason for that is that flint is not completely convertible. Um, and when I say flint, think like popcorn, right? right. As opposed to your stereotypical uh, field corn. Um, but that starch gets left behind during the fermentation if you don't use artificial enzymes and you get some really cool aromatic precursors that come across. Because Amanda Palmer is every color in the rainbow, right? And every one of those colors is a different amino acid. And all those amino acids have aromatic precursors that come across during distillation. And they tend to go like stone fruit. They tend to go like phenolic, like almost like think like um, when you eat a blackberry, like the uh, like around the seed area in the blackberry. Yeah. That very strong flavor that comes across there sort of blood plum sort of characteristics, lots of fruit that. stuff going on in there in particular. Um, in fact, the, the rye is really just there because I didn't want to do it as a, as a 90% corn whiskey, right? Um, or a 90% bourbon. Right. The rye is really just there so that you can get a traditional bourbon drinker to pick it up and go, oh, hey, there's something with 10% rye. Let's, let's give that a go. But um, right. the corn is definitely driving that mechanism all the way through. 
um, without a doubt. Uh, and then that is, you know, straight up double pot still like everything that we do. Yes. No chill filtration whatsoever. Still a number two charred oak barrel with a medium plus toast head, 53 gallon. Um, those are 36 month old air dried staves on that. Um, so, you know, pretty high end, pretty lofty ambitions from the get go there. And luckily it worked out. So it really did work out. I do get that fruit. I get some, some of those stone fruits on there. Uh, I get kind of this nice, um, slightly buttery undertone. I mean, there's mm -hmm. kind of this nice buttery creaminess that complements the fruit. Um, even against maybe a little touch of milk chocolate. I mean, that's what I'm grabbing off of this. That's that's awesome that you picked up on that because that that butteriness is so we don't do any sour mashing whatsoever at Spirits of French Lake. So right. we either do we don't also don't sweet mash though. So we either do citric acid to drop pH, or especially in this example, and you picked up on it, malolactic bacteria. That's what we did to get that effect. So um think of a, a lactic fermented wine and that sort of like right. buttery Chardonnay sort of thing. We're, we're trying to go for that same effect when we're using that malolactic bacteria. It's beautiful. It has some real beautiful elegance. And um, mm -hmm. with those notes, it gives some nice, deep um, X. I mean, I feel like it goes a little further into tasting like it's even older than it is. I mean, for me, it goes. I agree. Further. I think there's some real depth to it. Um, I also feel like that, that compared to a lot of what we've done at Spirits of French Lick, short of maybe something like Maddie Gladden, I feel like this one punches a little harder than some yeah. of the other ones do. It's it's got some it's got some heavier weight to it than some of the other ones do for sure. Um, and I think it's it's more of an example. It's more of something that, that a traditional bourbon drinker that drinks you know column distilled bourbon modified with rye, they could come to this and go, oh, oh, I okay. I see right. what's going on, right? <laughs> Versus throwing Lee Sinclair in front of them and being like, why in the hell are there oats in my bourbon? What's going on? What's <laughs> happening with this thing? So, Because it's all delicious, what Alan's doing. I know there's a lot of people who really enjoy uh, what you're doing um, watching. Uh, so please, y'all, if you have questions, ask down below. Um, Benjamin says you're all about that buttery mouth feel, and, and I know you, you do like that. Uh, I see Steven's a fan of... Uh, what you do, your brandies. Um, Kevin Rose says he's a big fan of the uh, in Dawson Falls as well. So if you have questions for um, Alan, ask away. I, there's always something new Alan's working on. The good news is we will be seeing this as a, a permanent expression, right? You will. It, it, you know, we we treated this one a lot like we did the original, like a lot of our one-off stuff where we were, we were coming out with some single barrels. We put out a few single barrels. In fact, I think there might be some bottles left of a few of the single barrels in the tasting room right now. And I know wow. Frankfurt Bourbon Society, we did an awesome barrel pick uh, with multiple distillers. It was, right. it was great. Like there were there were several of us. It was uh, none of us agreed on anything, but we were all in the in Dawson Falls. And so that's that's coming in the future as well. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah, so this will be a permanent staple. Um, it will change a little bit in time. So. It is uh, the most basic mash bill we do at 80% corn, 10% rye, and 10% just straight up distiller's malt. There's no modified malts in this, which is something okay. very different from most of our other whiskeys, just straight distiller's malt. But this past year, we decided to do a wheat version of it instead because I want to okay. see what that wheat does down the road. Yeah. We may even modify it a little bit more in the future. Hell, there might be, as a matter of fact, I take it back. I know there are because I did them this year and I forgot about it. There is a Lee Sinclair with that Amanda Palmer corn in it that we made this past year as well so um it'll be interesting to see how that plays in the future a little hybrid between those two products too so um yeah so this one this first release uh go ahead and grab this one if you get a chance to because i will tell you it was only nine barrels now we have more barrels than that in the in the vault but this is one of those bourbons that we have that will hold up to long aging um so i was real oh, careful wow. picking the barrels right and saving back quite a few more. I think from the first year's production, we had right at 110 barrels. And then year two, the yield was a little lower. The deer got into it year two. And I think we yielded something like 52 barrels or something like that. So there's still 40 something of those barrels from that bottling in the warehouse right now. Okay. So with this release, we're looking at how many... It's going to be somewhat limited as far as the bottles go. Yeah, I don't remember how many bottles it was. It would be uh, maybe four pallets, something like that. Okay. It's definitely a little bit more limited. And 
And I think that that's an okay thing. I think that's a good thing, right? That's it's, um, yes. maybe there ought to be certain things that we're hard to find to some degree, anyways. But there ought to be certain things that are maybe even a little harder to find, so that when you do find one, it seems pretty, pretty special. I think so. Yeah, feels special. It's something that takes a little long, but you have you have some right now. If anyone comes, probably the next several days uh, yep. this week, you'll yep. have them in your um. We've got them in the tasting room, and they are going out room. to distribution, so you can get that. So. Um, I don't remember how many, what states for sure we're all in now, but uh, right. you will be able to get that for sure in Indiana. Uh, if, there, if somebody's not carrying it, Johnson Brothers is our distributor. Ask for it in Kentucky. Heritage is our distributor. Ask for it there. Um, and hopefully all the markets will pick it up. Amazing. It's it's so interesting. It's uh, it's deep. It has, um, it has a, a, a certain... Power that's not too aggressive, but also mm-hmm. has layering and is also easy at the same time. At, at um, hundred proof, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of balance it has to, to really hit all those check all those boxes. It's it's right. graceful, but it can hit for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the re- one of the really cool things about that too is you know we do that low barrel entry proof at 105. So right there is very little water in that blend. Um, some of those barrels. Some of the barrels that we picked in particular were right on the line of 100 proof as it was by the time okay. they came out of that barrel barn. So you're getting almost the purest expression of whiskey out of a barrel that you can possibly get right there. And if you ever get a single barrel of it, um, you're going to get it at barrel proof. And that barrel proof is probably going to be 102, 103. So the barrel proof of, on this one would be around 102, mm-hmm. 103. Yep. You're entering it so, so much lower than yeah. Most yeah, distilleries do. I keep uh, painting myself in the weird corners where I don't have any hazmat bourbons, but I end up with hazmat apple brandy. So you know, it just <laughs> becomes a thing. So those are very special indeed. And you, uh, you do, and of course, be watching for uh, in Dawson Falls. This is really one. Uh, if you're not too far away from where this is distillery only, or are you going to be in the states? Nope, it'll be in. Be it'll be in the states over. distribution too. Okay. Yeah, and so and you know, look for it. On, on that real quick, too, I, I should probably yeah, this sure. out because I, I know people are, are, are going to be wondering. So the name Hindostan Falls. So oh, yes, that is um, the name of an abandoned town in Martin County, Indiana. Um, it's also a, a um, geological landmark, um, an actual falls. Uh, if you guys are familiar with like whetstones for sharpening your knives, that is uh, a lot of that came out of that area. That's the Hindostan whetstones is what they call that. Um, but a beautiful geographical feature. And what had happened where the name came from was there was a, a gentleman who was a soldier, um, a British soldier fighting in India, uh, came into the Indiana Territory, settled this town. Uh, the town is adjacent to the farm that the owners of the distillery own. Like they actually have a piece of what had been the town of Hendoston on the property where we grow that corn, which is pretty damn special um, in my opinion. But uh, town ended up getting wiped out by various uh, different diseases. There was a big mill there. And as with most of the Midwestern towns, um, that mill and in the summertime, you had the dam there backing up water. And so the water would get you know pretty stagnant. You'd have disease come in. And so it wiped out the town, basically. Um, there's still some remnants. You can go out to Hendoston. A lot of people go out there and go fishing. Uh, there's a big piece of limestone that juts out into the river. And that's where they had the mill built. And you can still to this day see the posts where the they had it you know built up above the river. And they dug these square holes for the post to go into into that limestone. Oh, wow. um, Evergreen, once in a while, you'll even find an old square nail out there in one of those holes, which is kind of a cool little keepsake from the old town of Hendoston. So um, I thought it was a cool story. I thought it was a really cool place, you know, and I thought it was, it's you know, that's something you got. If that's if that's their family farm or the owners of the distillery and you're growing the corn there, you almost have to name it that. Like there's no... There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, especially if you're going to call yourself Spirits of French Lick and be about the spirits of the local place and the people of the local place. So um, it just fit. It just fit. I, I love that there's always a story and an inspiration uh, that's so much deeper than just a name with what you do. And I know so many people are uh, saying this uh, as well. Uh, I see um, MZ watching, saying, can't wait to try the uh, Lee Sinclair with the Amanda Palmer corn. And uh, then Dawson is something so special. It really is. Steve Gibbons enjoying the uh, Alan Bishop history lesson. I always do as well. We always learn so much about state, wonderful state of Indiana, our state. And um, you have some 
it's a, a new brandy, fairly new brandy coming too. Is that right? Yeah. So um, it's actually it's out now. It's tasting room only. I think I think maybe there might be a few cases going in the distribution in Indiana because people have asked. But we did um, what we call Dionysus. So named obviously after the, the, the god of uh, wine and bacchanalia and, you know, festivities and, and all the heathen shit that, you know, <laughs> brandy and wine causes. But um, anyway, so that was um, a Catawba brandy. So this is the first first great brandy, first aged great brandy I've released since I left Copper and Kings. Um, it was the one category they had me pinned down on on a non-compete was aged great brandy. And I've okay. been out of that for a number of years. But um Anyways, put that down. And this is actually, we have some older stuff of this back in the in the barrel room too, because I'm holding on to some for like a 10 to a 12 year old in the future. But this oh, is wow. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're trying I'm trying to build up some stocks to where we can do some. We've even got really some old ones. Sinclair from 2017 right now that we're just it's just sitting there waiting. So um, but long and short of it is it is hundred percent Catawba grapes, uh, no capitalization. Um, this particular bottling was fermented in the distillery as opposed to in the winery and then bought from the winery to bring in the still, we actually fermented this ourselves. So this had the, um, the McCoy yeast strain from the old mm -hmm. McCoy distillery in Orange County, Indiana, okay. um, and all double pot distilled, no chill filtration. But the really cool thing about it is it came out of two French oak barrels, 64 gallon Bordeaux barrels. Um, oh, both okay. had been master venter barrels that had bought, been bought at a trade show years ago that, that never got used for anything. So they were falling apart when I found them. I had them recouped and one of them, I had them put a heavier toast on and the other one I actually had them put a number two char on, on the French oak. And uh, so you're getting some of that spiciness come through, but Catawba is a very phenolic uh, grape. It's very, right. uh, for those who aren't familiar with Catawba, if you drink much wine, uh, Muscat is somewhat similar as far as like being big and bold and aggressive and very kind of almost perfumey, um, almost citrusy, even in a lot of ways. Um, so it held up really well to that kind of French oak spice in particular. So we did the two barrels of that. Um, the reason I wanted to really lean into that is because there was a long tradition of making Catawba brandy here in the Ohio Valley. So in Switzerland County, Indiana, and I've talked about this many times with them making absinthe and also wine in Vivi, Vive, however you want to say it. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that wrong too, but uh, <laughs> not as scared of them as I am those Martin County people. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. But uh, anyways, so they made Catawba wine and Catawba brandy, and then that industry sort of grew into Cincinnati. Cincinnati became a huge producer of Catawba brandy at one point in time, but the point is, uh, Cardinal Spirits had at one point in time released a Catawba brandy, but no one in Indiana had done a bottled and bond Catawba brandy since prior to Prohibition. So this returned bottled and bond Catawba brandy to Hoosiers, um, which is kind of a big deal to me. Um, and also played into the Daisy Spring Mill history, the Spring Mill State Park history, because uh, they did make a little Catawba brandy back in the day. Never a whole lot, but always around 300 gallons a year. So... So this is the first one of its kind that has been released since pre-prohibition. Yep, a bottled Mon Catawba brandy, absolutely. And the first that you have done that since you were at Copper and Kings. At Copper and Kings, that was aged. Like yep. That. Yep. Okay. Yep. We do have a, a white version of it. We released in the tasting right. room some years ago, and and uh, it's it's great. It's kind of a, a an agave spirit alternative sort of thing. Yeah. Those citrus notes come through pretty heavy in it, but this I was actually. Um, I was drinking through the Dionysus last night and kind of revisiting my tasting notes on it. And we always, my friend, my group of friends, we all joke back and forth about fat kid tasting notes. Right. So, and how does it relate to food or like, especially like really unhealthy food. But um, I had one that just hit me in the face out of nowhere, man. I, I, I poured the glass and I hadn't even stuck my nose on it. It was just sitting on the table on the picnic table outside. And I smelled it and I'm like, I know that aroma. And then it hit me. I was like, that is straight up Ghostbusters Ecto Cooler from the 1980s and 1990s. Like the little like high C drinks. Because it was one that. they made that was a Ghostbusters theme. Yeah, yeah, it was a very specific, very again, very dorky thing that like five people get that joke. But and yeah. it came, yeah, no, I re I remember when that was. I don't know if I remember the was a high C. You said they did mm -hmm. a high C. Yeah, it was I high C. The high C Ecto Cooler is what it was. High C Yeah, yeah. tell us down below if you. Uh, yeah. yeah remember and, uh any of that and that sounds so delicious and also as you're watching take a moment like this video share it i know there's so many um good folks just like myself that are big fans of alan and, and spirits of french lick and the team there 
and just love what you do. I mean, you do such creative, well thought, uh, beautiful products like these. So, well done. I sh on should everything. mention on the the Dionysus too. I don't have the bottle in here, but it does have a really cool label. Um, uh, Brooklyn Leary had uh, a friend of hers that's a tattoo artist. Um, he actually drew this beautiful illustration of Dionysus as, uh, as the green man version of Dionysus. As Dionysus <laughs> ages and gets older, right? And the, the grapes, you know, are kind of wrapped around his face, etc. And so it was a really cool piece of, of, uh, of art um, that I really enjoyed. So nice little conceptualized thing, you know. Very nice. Let's see if I can... If I can bring up the right window, I will. Um, I'll show a picture of this. This does look so much fun, and this is actually this is out now. Mm -hmm. That's out now in the tasting room. Absolutely it's out now. Is this is this a tasting room only uh, one? It is a tasting room only. I, I do think that maybe Johnson is. is going to pick up a couple of cases. Yeah, there it is. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I love that uh, that green man concept. I think that's a really cool. That is beautiful. Really cool I love thing. That. So. Um, yeah, I just you know I had to play into a little bit of the um, the more esoteric leanings that I have when when it came to naming that one. So for sure, excellent. But, uh, I felt good to finally release an age great brandy again. So I see we have fans from across the country uh, watching from uh, everywhere from the West Coast to Indiana. Again, awesome. if any questions, yeah, from uh, for um. Alan, uh, please ask away, as I know there's some people that love uh, what it, what he's doing there. And I, as the more I, you probably see me, if you see my arm continuing to do this over to the side, I this is actually me pouring more um, Hindustan Falls bourbon. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. That uh, that Hindustan, I haven't done it yet, but it's uh, it's on the list of experiments. Um, mm. Probably going to pull one of the older barrels of that before too long and maybe put it on a little bit of French oak this fall um, and let it set back over the winter time and just see how that plays as well. I've got some I've got some staves that I'm not going to tell you they're they're exactly, you know, the the same thing that Makers 46 uses, but they're not right. terribly different from what Makers uses. So that might be a fun little little experiment to play with. So. Excellent, and and we should say, you know, this is uh, we're 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 not quite all the way through September, but this is indeed uh, National Bourbon Heritage Month. And while we love Kentucky bourbon, <laughs> there's so many events that happen in Kentucky. In fact, as I was telling Alan and inviting him over, I'll be doing one next week for those of you all that are near Louisville. I'll be doing one at um, Bourbon's Bistro, a cigar and a bourbon pairing there next Thursday, and hopefully we'll see some of you all there. Um, Indiana. Indiana is so important to the history of bourbon. Um, any, I mean, obviously you've already given us some great fun facts about Hindustan, but as you talk to people about heritage of bourbon in Indiana, what do you think people sometimes don't know? I don't, I don't think most people have any idea about, uh, about the history of bourbon in Indiana. Truthfully, I, th I think that we're, we're getting there um, slowly. I think, I think even a lot of the distillers don't necessarily know that pre-prohibition history and and uh they certainly should because those are all sales points for the state you know um and I, the way that i always break it down historically is if you if you think about bourbon the name bourbon doesn't show up till 1823 and ostensibly all bourbon is is a corn whiskey at that time there's no you know guaranteed new oak barrel right it's just basically corn whiskey well you look at southern ohio and southern indiana they've got you know basically the same population same minerals in the water same ph in the water distilleries all across that region and the interesting thing about southern indiana in particular with bourbon is that if you were making corn whiskey at that time and you wanted to ship to a southern market unless you got on the river south of the falls of the ohio you had to cross into kentucky and get back on the river or you'd lose everything at the falls of the ohio so how much of that early quote unquote bourbon was really made in Indiana and Southern Ohio. Um, and to the extent that by 1818, there were, there's a record of 200 barrels of corn whiskey being shipped just from the town of Salem, Indiana, not the surrounding County, but just the town of Salem, Indiana. So if they're shipping 200 barrels at that time in 1818, two years after we become a state, um, you know, how much was actually being consumed locally? How much was really being made at that time? Uh, but, you know, not that different. I, I always joke, again, Southern Indiana is Hoosier-occupied Northern Kentucky. You know, it's um, 
it's not so different. And Northern Indiana had some massive distilleries. You know, they, they didn't specialize in bourbon, but they certainly made some. Uh, you look over at Tell City, the old Krogman distillery. You know, right. they were, they, that's, everybody thinks of MGP and that's the easy one to go to, or, you know, any of the old Lawrenceburg area distilleries, because there were multiples of them over there. But I mean, hell, Krogman was the same size as any of those places were, was, was way back when. So um, certainly a great legacy there. And that's, that's not too far down the road from French Lick either. That's right. So, so much history right there. And, and you're helping um, revive the history, tell us the, the history, but also look to the future too, which I love. But the I'm cool the cool thing about it is we have we've got some platforms like you helping us out with it, and then also, so be on the lookout for this. There is a um, an IU documentary team filming a documentary sure. right now about both the history and the modern era of distilling in the state of Indiana. Um, this coming Saturday uh, in Lawrence County, Indiana, I will be at the Daisy Spring Mill Distillery for oh, the goodness. candlelight tour for Spring Mill State Park. Um, last year I did that, and I told the whole. The whole history did the whole spill of the distillery there and distilling in southern indiana and myself and brian cushing uh from the victorian bar room right and it went on it went on for it felt like forever by the end of the night what we found out was there were over seven thousand people that came through that park that night it wow. i had no voice left i'm sure i'll be like uh, like on sunday i won't be able to speak <laughs> so um this year, unfortunately, Brian can't attend with me, so I'm bringing my still hand, Justin Whaley, and we're gonna see we're gonna see how proficient he is at telling this story. I'm gonna put him on the spot. <laughs> so. Incredible! And again, that's this Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it starts at four o'clock, I believe. It's spring well. Yep, yep. I would I would suggest uh, if you're coming, try to get there early because uh, I know last year they had cars lined up all the way back to Mitchell. If you're familiar with where Spring Mill is, that's a that's a pretty good pretty good traffic back up. Wild. So, wow. but. that is so cool. And I, I'm seeing we've we've started we started a conversation here. DJ Henderson, thank you for watching. Uh, Kentucky just had a better publicist back in the day. DJ DJ, I'm not saying this. Look, there's so many bourbons I love, but DJ said Indiana bourbon's better. So. Uh, I could say discuss amongst yourselves down below. That's what I'm, I'm going to poke fun at my brother DJ a little bit. That that's my best friend in the world right there. Oh, it, my okay, neighbor, thank you, DJ. neighbor two two houses over. But uh, he he quoted me there, and it's a great quote, I think. But it, I have to pick on him a little bit. It's funny coming from DJ who buys Evan Williams every week. Likes it, Evan Williams. <laughs> yep, likes it. Likes the bottled Ma and Evan Williams. I don't blame him. It's a good him. one. You know, it's, it's a good, good one. It's good. Well, we love what's happening in Indiana, Kentucky. And across the country with bourbon, I mean the the showcasing of of different grains of terroir. I mean, obviously, there's just so much happening, and that's why for National Bourbon Heritage Month, we're not just raising a toast to just a couple places. It's everybody, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody's doing something uh, across the country, and um, so many states are. You know, it just I love seeing. Do you have any states? That, I mean, obviously, I love these. Do you have any states that you get excited about trying a bourbon from this state or that state yourself? I do actually. So, um, um, and not just bourbon, but also other right. things. But um, I can think of it, there's three that immediately, well, we'll say four that immediately come to mind. So, first is Pennsylvania. Um, right. And obviously, there's a lot of rye whiskey production there, but there's also oh, some yeah. bourbon. Liberty Pole has got a, a fantastic oh, yeah. smoked bourbon that I, I absolutely love. Um, Colorado, of course, uh, you mm -hmm. know, like you got, you got deer hammer, you got Leopold. I love that stuff. Agreed. And Texas. I love Texas. I, I, yeah. I absolutely love what iron root Republic is doing in particular. Um, Harbinger has cost me more than one day at work <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, and I'll tell you, I think Ohio has got some real potential, you know, yeah. and Ohio has got a great home distilling culture too. So you got a lot of guys and gals that are, that are learning how to do things in a very old fashioned way at home and moving into the legal industry. Um, and then here in Indiana, there's, there's so many of them that so many good ones. Yeah. Cardinal. I've, I've really become to, to love and respect a lot of what Cardinal's doing. Obviously they're not doing a lot of bourbon stuff, but with a lot right. of botanical stuff. Right. Um, same thing. I love, I love hard truth. Absolutely oh, love hard truth. Yeah. The Huber boys are doing some really cool stuff. And of course, Jason up at old 55, lots of small places popping up that are really doing some cool stuff too. Um, and we now have an Indiana state distillers guild too. Um, 
after trying to organize other people, not me, I'm not the one to organize this kind of shit, but uh, <laughs> after them trying to organize it three separate times, we finally made it to the point where we've had two meetings and people shoot showed up and nobody got in a fight. So beautiful. Congrats on that. That's uh, mm -hmm. those, again, those are some all some very solid states. And I see a lot of people commenting down below. Tell us down below if you have any favorite ones. Um, I'll, I'll also add to that just because I've, I had the chance to try so many. I'm really a big fan of what's happening in the state of New York. I love yeah. uh, the Empire Rise, the the terroir, just the, the interesting element they're great mm -hmm. um, in part. East Coast, too, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, but there's so many things happening, and I think we're going to see more, uh, more and more just uh, really shining through. But, again, real toast to you, my friend, on what you've done for Indiana. And, Thanks, man. Uh, we're, yeah. we're trying. We're trying, right? We're trying slowly but surely. Yeah. We're getting there. We're changing. We're changing minds, right? We're not. Um, right. We're not going to be the capital of bourbon anytime soon. Nor do I think we should aspire to be. But I certainly think that we can. Um, we can bring something unique to the entirety of the world of distillation overall, and I, I certainly think that that's starting to happen. And and uh, I I can tell you this: when I first started at Spirits of French Lick in the first few years, Indiana was a hard state as far as the market went. They were. You know, there's some other distillers that had way better luck in the state than what we did. Um, we caught on in other states, particularly southern markets, before we ever did here. But Indiana's changing and it's coming around. And uh, evidence of that is, you know, we just did two hazmat apple brandy barrel picks with Indiana bourbon and final third cigar bar. Cigar and bar. I cannot tell you how overjoyed I am to see high proof Indiana made apple brandy back in the state of Indiana. I love it. Pairing them with some cigars up there at final yes. third, right? Yeah, man. And these were these were killers too. They were one of the barrels, I believe, was at 149. Oh, um, the other one was at like 143 or something like that. Um, I know Indiana Bourbon sold out of his half of so it was two half barrels, is what we sold them. We're gonna release the other halves of those two barrels in the tasting room down the road. Um, but Indiana Bourbon sold out of his half of those two barrels in 25 minutes that's pretty that made me feel pretty damn good you know that people are out there seeking out that high proof apple brandy so um if you like high proof bourbons i promise you you're gonna like high proof apple brandy without a doubt and if you don't like it just drink about three shots of it and you'll be sure that you do like it It'll you might like right. something after that, I guess. <laughs> right that's, that's, uh, that's for sure 149 i mean this is this is uh the highest one you've seen has been what that you've done uh you know i haven't i haven't gone through and tested them 149 would be at the very top i right mean top. I'd, I'd bet in that warehouse there's probably some 150s for right. sure i would say so um you know it's a uh, we've done maybe i think 12 or 13 of those single barrels of, of that hazmat now so it's starting to really really become a thing that people are seeking out um I hope they keep seeking it out. I hope they seek it out to the extent that uh, my employers have no choice but to buy a whole lot more apple juice every year. Um, I'm perfectly fine with 30% of the company being apple brandy. Whatever it takes, man. That's fine. Right. That's that's our Hoosier heritage there. So. That's a, absolutely right. It's, and it's delicious apple brandy. And that hazmat uh, brandy is just so beautiful. And if you can yeah. imagine, just put put a couple ice cubes on it and have a, uh, a serious cigar. And it was it's a mm -hmm. great pairing. It'll last you a little while. You know, and this sounds this sounds sacrilegious. I'll I'll throw this out there too. But the old school uh, Southern Indiana way of consuming apple brandy and peach brandy was to pour a glass and put about a half teaspoon of honey in it, and that's yeah, the way they, they serve put, it. They just put that was kind of an instant cocktail. Then, yep, right and that's a, that's exactly how they drank it. So, and if and if you can't get to those uh, the cigar lounge or or any other place, do you have some of the hazmat there at the distillery or? So, um, and it, it's final, final third cigar bars where that would be at up in Indianapolis, a mm -hmm. uh, fantastic place, uh, great cigar selection. Definitely yeah. check those guys out. You'll love them. And of course you guys probably all know the social media account, uh, Indiana bourbon. Um, yeah. but we will have those in the future. It's, t it tends to be our policy that if we split barrels with customers, we try to wait a good little ways, at least until maybe they're sold out or they're almost sold out of that product before we release ours. However, there are almost always some form of high proof apple brandy in the tasting room. So I think we still have some 113 proof complexity, which is the apple brandy 100% um, matured in tequila barrels. 
Right. I believe that there is a hazmat apple brandy currently in the tasting room that was a or finished in some stout barrels and has a really, really nice sort of uh, chocolatey and banana note that goes along with the apple as well. So that sounds incredible. That's mm -hmm. it's all delicious. And again, if you're uh any place close to uh French Lick, uh Spirits of French Lick is the uh place to go take a tour. Um, tours are you can get a tour most days of the week. What's the what's the story there? So I don't have that memorized anymore, unfortunately. Oh, and I think oh. they're revising that, but definitely call and you can get a tour set up through yep. the week um or on the weekends, either way. Uh they'll get that set up for you without a doubt. Um, unfortunately. Uh, I don't keep up with all that because I'm back there doing the production stuff and then doing all this stuff. So, um, yeah, come check it out, guys. Uh, there's uh, Listen, there's something for everybody in that tasting room. I mean, we, you know, we kind of do a little bit of everything. We don't do anything that's flavored post-distillation short of maybe some uh, finishing barrels and that's it. But there's never anything, never anything added to any of our liquor whatsoever uh, other than water and barrel. That's it. Very cool, my friend. And again, spirits spirits of Frenchlick.com is the place to go to find when you can um, do a tour, visit the tasting room, try some of these beautiful uh, whiskeys, brandies, spirits, or just be uh, looking for them. Find out where to find them mm -hmm. in uh, in your region on that same link. Uh, big congrats on the um, in Dawson. This is really Thank really you. a nice stepper and just really an, an excellent bourbon. Mm -hmm. A lot of depth. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I've, I've switched up over the years when I do tastings, uh, go to festivals and stuff. Uh, for a while, it was Lee Sinclair, and then um, I got bored with that, and then it went to went to Apple Brandy. And I never get bored with Apple Brandy, but the problem is I get way too drunk on Apple Brandy. So <laughs> then we moved over to Solomon Scott Rye Whiskey. Now we're on to uh, the Hindostan. So uh, that's, uh, you know, you got to have something that reminds you a little bit that you're drinking when you're doing a festival or else you get yourself in a little trouble. So it, it good, it's always good to be reminded because mm -hmm. the, the brandy can be pretty smooth. and, and easy. Right. That's that's a problem with the high proof brandy. That's uh you don't realize <laughs> it. It doesn't. It just kind of sneaks up on you for sure. So. I don't know how many barrels we tasted with those boys, but man, they uh, that required a cool down period and a trip to the restaurant, and there was a whole get yourself straight before you go home. So, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure there was a, a bit of a transition there before uh, anyone went back to work. Uh, that's yes, yeah, 100. <laughs> yeah, percent There's no work on those days. That, that those days, you just might as well. That's done. It's over with. <laughs> I don't. I know they don't currently have it on the calendar, but if uh, if you drink hot proof apple brandy like that, there's a day that actually falls between Wednesday and Thursday. It's called Wan's Day. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh man, it's always a pleasure, Alan, the alchemist there at Spirits of French Lick. Thank you so much for joining us uh, live here on Bourbon Blog. Thanks everybody watching. There's so many, uh, so many of you all that had some great questions, comments. Take a moment again as you. Uh, as you sign off and, and head towards your favorite bottle, like and share it, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Cheers. Always a pleasure, my friend.